welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I'm Swapnil Joglika. Let's take a look at the stories for the day. High attrition rate has been dragging down the profitability of Indian IT companies for the last few quarters. While their efforts to arrest the attrition rates have started showing some results, the recent Q4 numbers of three top IT companies showed that it was still hovering around 20%. So how are Indian IT companies dealing with high attrition rates? Tushar Varma brings you the answer. It may be the end of those days when IT companies were seen firefighting talent management. India's software services companies are projected to see a drop in attrition rates in the coming quarters. Fiscal year 2022 witnessed attrition across India's IT bellwethers touch an unprecedented 25%, according to a team lease report. It was triggered by mass layoffs and employees landing bitter opportunities. Attrition at Infosys for the fourth quarter of FY23 stood at 20.9% down from the 24.3% in the third quarter and 27.7% in the second quarter. Attrition rate at TCS also comes down to 20.1% in quarter 4 FY23. Unlike Infosys, TCS increased its headcount by around 22,600 employees in FY23, but its attrition remained much higher than the pre-pandemic levels of 12 to 13%. Here's an overview of the attrition scenario in the sector. Uh, the attrition rates in the Indian IT sector remains high and the average is uh, above 20% uh, till the last quarter, which is, uh, you know, quite high compared to the benchmark which we have seen uh, at the pre-COVID period. Now, uh, this is partly because of the demand and supply gap, which is there still exists. But even though they ha it has in uh, decreased to a certain extent, but it is not a significant decrease, I would say, at this point in time that we start celebrating. So um, this is going to last for some, some more time. Another bellwether of the Indian IT service companies, HCL, reported an attrition of 19.5% in quarter 4 FY23. This was a decrease as against 21.7% in quarter 3 FY23. HCL also added a significant number of employees in the last quarter. The number stood at 4,480. While attrition rates are headed downhill for all IT majors, they are still much higher than their pre-pandemic levels, which was between 6 to 16%. So, how are Indian IT companies dealing with high attrition? Yeah, so I think in general, the way to deal with high attrition is to increase hiring, which is what the response companies had during COVID. Now, what's happened is that there is softness in demand, uh, particularly from U.S. Uh, uh, clients and also European clients. So co companies are a little retrospect in attrition. In fact, everyone believes that attrition is going to come down further uh, to uh, pre-COVID levels, right, which are, I think, reasonably uh, healthy levels. You have to also note that in an IT company, some attrition is also good because not everyone who gets hired has the ability to walk up the pyramid. So healthy attrition rate between 12 to 15 percent is usually manageable and actually desirable for an IT company. Infosys, which saw a sharp drop in attrition rate and reduction in number of employees, is yet to share a hiring target for FY24. This comes as a surprise since the company is known for regular hiring every fiscal year. With attrition rates hovering above pre-COVID levels, what needs to be done to get it down to normal levels? I would suggest that um, the organization culture can help them retain. And if the organization is more purpose-driven organization, where uh, employees can relate their own purpose with organizational purpose and goals. If there is empathy in the organization which exists, they can help uh, you know, to retain more people comparatively. Sometimes the offers which they get is so lucrative that even though there are attractive benefits to stay back, uh, they still uh, tend to switch over. So culture is very important. Organizations do spend a lot of time on strategy, but very less time on culture. 
the attrition rates have been high, only to come down in the last quarter of FY23. But how will they turn out to be in FY24? Here's what experts share on what to expect. Yeah, so for me, there are two scenarios, right? Scenario number one is there's a scenario of... Uh... Uh, just a softening of demand and a slowdown of demand. Uh, with that, what will happen is that the attrition, which is both voluntary and involuntary attrition, will actually come down and normalize to pre-COVID levels. And that's because the voluntary attrition will become nearly zero because there are no real opportunities outside your current company where people are suddenly going to give you a pay hike. The real issue to worry about if you're an employee of such a company is involuntary attrition. If there's a dramatic scenario like a recession in the U.S., and a dramatic cut in IT spends, then what will happen? IT companies will be forced to use involuntary attrition as a involuntary attrition as a tool to reduce headcount, right? So in that scenario, you may see attrition increase, but then that's the wrong kind of attrition in a way. It's not voluntary attrition, it's actually involuntary attrition which will increase, which is also a very likely scenario. Experts say that some level of attrition is desirable in IT companies. However, the present scenario is far from that. Some suggest that improving the culture of the organization for employees to resonate with companies' goals can help retain people. The good news is that attrition is coming down. But how exactly will things pan out remains to be seen. For some IT companies, the attrition rates had shot up to 30% during the pandemic due to increased demand for digitization. Meanwhile, COVID cases were on the rise till Saturday. The number of fresh cases reported in the seven days ending Saturday was the highest record in India in the last eight months. This implies that India has just witnessed a COVID wave of sorts. While there may be early signs that the situation is improving, can the country afford to shrug it off? Pashwar Kumar's report has the answer. People, it seems, have moved on. Life is bustling again, leaving behind the scars of the pandemic. Markets, schools and colleges, trains, metros and buses are bursting at the seams, announcing that India is about to become the world's most populous country. Some recent events, like the ongoing IPL matches and the opening of Apple stores, also suggest that even the latest surge in COVID cases has not hit the lives of most people. India reported almost 74,000 fresh COVID cases in the seven-day period ending April 22nd. This was a 20% jump from the almost 62,000 cases reported in the preceding period. In fact, the latest week's case count was reportedly the highest recorded in India in the eight months since the middle of August last year. The country's weekly cases have remained above the 50,000 mark since April 14th. The good news is that the recent surge witnessed in COVID cases has started showing signs of peaking. The seven-day test positivity rate, or TPR, has seen a drop for the first time in close to two months. On April 22nd, the seven-day TPR stood at 5.41%, down from 5.58% a day before. According to one report, data from Delhi, Haryana and Tamil Nadu also showed that the surge was, at the very least, close to peaking. On April 23rd, the daily COVID cases dropped to 7,178, from 10,112 the previous day. Nonetheless, the recent surge in cases has shown some characteristics of a wave. When we talk of a wave, we are talking about rising numbers. But if it is only the number of diagnosed persons with infection that we are counting, then certainly there is a wave in terms of that rise. But if we are really looking at a wave in terms of serious illness, landing people in hospital or intensive care, then there is no such real wave. So, how will the latest wave play out and are more surges likely? Every pandemic, every epidemic of a new variant, the same pattern will come, start, peak, go down. There is no guarantee it will peak all over India simultaneously. 
you will see in each geographic area there will be a clean peak and clean fall. And we have had several, not one or two, several surges, several peaks. Okay, some documented, some very not very well documented. They're gone. And till Sunday, COVID cases were still rising in several parts of India. Apart from the eastern states of West Bengal, Bihar and Odisha, the surge in cases reportedly continued in Rajasthan, Chhattisgarh and Punjab. However, the silver lining is that despite the rise in cases, in absolute terms, eastern India has not recorded a high number of infections yet. So, even though the recent surge is showing signs of peaking, there may still be some steam left in it. Against this backdrop, how should India respond to not only the latest COVID wave, but also similar surges in the future? Travel restrictions are unnecessary unless the number of serious cases are rising. A watch should be kept upon what type of variant is in bringing people into hospital and intensive care and try and do genomic analysis so that to find out whether new variants are emerging, which are likely to turn more problematic. Similarly, at the community level, you can do wastewater surveillance in order to find out whether there are a large number of cases likely to arise because the numbers of viruses uh, in the excreta in the wastewater are also rising sharply, and particularly if there are any new variants that are coming in. We have to be, as a healthcare system, as to be very vigilant because what we have been blessed with, an Omicron virus, which does not have the capacity to cause the same kind of pneumonia as its predecessors. Only problem with this particular virus is that they keep changing the shape so often, and every new one is an immune mutant. You know, we are able to overcome our immunity. It will cause surges, but there's nothing you can do about it because none of the vaccines work. Part of the reason that stringent measures have not been called for this time is because how the latest wave has been different from previous ones. The population is not immunologically naive. Uh, it has some immunity conferred by vaccines, some immunity conferred by prior exposure to the earlier forms of the virus. And therefore, with all of that, it's able to also resist the infection when it happens in the human body. And at the same time, our health systems are better, but much better prepared for a response. So in all ways, this particular wave, as we are calling it, is uh, likely to be far less lethal and dangerous uh, than what happened with uh, Delta. Ultimately, this means that India should not shrug off the latest COVID wave or threats posed by future variants which need to be tracked diligently. However, the stringent measures of the initial waves are no longer necessary, as long as future variants remain relatively mild. Moving on, FMCG major ITC has swiftly extended the bull run on the bourses this year as risks of cigarette taxes remain at bay. So after doubling investors' wealth in the last two years, does the stocks rally have more legs? Harshita Singh brings a report. Cigarette to Hotel Conglomerate ITC has been one of the best performing FMCG stocks in calendar year 2023 with a 23% gain as compared to a 3% decline in the Nifty index and a 6% rise in Nifty FMCG. Over the last one year, it has outperformed the benchmarks by rallying 56% versus a 3% and 23.5% gain in the Nifty and Nifty FMCG indices. In fact, this FMCG stock has doubled investors' wealth over the last two years as it notched a fresh high of rupees. 410 last week from a level of Rs 199.95 of May 2021. With this, its market capitalization has crossed the 5 trillion rupees mark for the first time, surpassing home loan major HDFC. Analysts believe the stock's rally is not over yet with more steam left in the counter given its strong long-term fundamentals. Consensus Bloomberg estimates show that the stock can gain 6% to Rs 435.6, while some brokerages see a potential upside of up to 17% in the script. You know, the, this company has not been growing in the last five years. You know, it is hardly you know, in the last one year there is a growth, and that too because you now government has not increased any sin tax or tax on cigarettes. 
and now all their vertical has started to do very good you now they have hotels where the occupancy is very high okay you now they have paper which has started to do very well after russia ukraine war you know which which is into one year which is completed and you know the cigarette business the volume has started to improve because the imported cigarette or smuggled cigarette you now which doesn't attract any tax you now that share has come down so you know i think you know the growth has just now started for them so i think you know the stock has potential to give another 15 20% return in next one year The rise in the stock is expected to be led by its FMCG foods business scale up. The FMCG margins are expected to touch 13% by FY25 from the current level of 9.1%. Sustained double digit volume growth in the cigarette business will also aid sentiment. Analysts at Centrum Broking say ITC is well positioned for long term value creation led by stability in tobacco taxation, healthy volume growth in cigarettes, solid underlying performance in foods driving profitability, improving outlook for the hotel business. and resilient momentum in the paper business meanwhile clsa recently said that re-rating catalysts are playing out for itc while its hotel businesses demerger for value unlocking remains crucial to watch that said technical analysts believe the stock can even double to 800 rupees levels over the next 2 years itc share is in a bull run as per the monthly chart setup the breakout above 400 has further triggered next level of upside from a medium term perspective the counter can easily double as long as it holds 360 as the support mark one can see a gradual upside in itc shares that can take this counter to 800 levels itc remains a preferred fmcg bet of analysts given its firm growth expectations and attractive valuations to peers that said equity market action will be guided by q4 earnings today results of bajaj auto and nestle among others will be watched Q4 results are taking the heat of the financial markets which have been reeling under pressure for a while now but there is no let up outside the plush offices of the lal street just an hours drive from bombay stock exchange at least 14 people lost their lives due to heat stroke just last week they were attending a government function in navi mumbai several parts of the country are in the grip of unforgiving heat wave now in today's decoded segment tushar verma explains what is a heat wave According to India Meteorological Department or IMD a heat wave is a condition when the maximum temperature of a plain region breaches the 40 degrees celsius mark while for the hilly region the threshold is 30 degrees celsius for the coastal region it is 37 degrees celsius In a normal situation when the maximum temperature of a station is less than or equal to 40 degrees celsius then the departure should be 4.5 degrees celsius to 6.4 degrees celsius to qualify for the heat wave and when the normal maximum temperature of a station is more than 40 degrees celsius then departure from normal should be 4 degrees celsius to 5 degrees celsius for severe heat wave the departure from normal is 6 degrees celsius or more and a heat wave should be declared when actual maximum temperature remains 45 degrees celsius or more irrespective of normal maximum temperature months from march to june experience the most number of heat waves in india and the situation is turning grim with the passage of time with experts pointing towards climate change a recent study by the university of cambridge said that 90% of the country lives in extremely cautious or danger zones from heat wave impact and a study published in the medical journal the lancet said that india saw a 55% rise in deaths due to extreme heat between 2000 to 2004 and 2017 to 2021 An official record suggests that average temperatures in India have risen by around 0.7% between 1901 and 
Sometimes the wind that flows in massive cycles across the world gets trapped locally. Why? Because sometimes, like these days, the temperature is so high that it sucks the air in, heats it up and keeps it trapped. This prevents the air from rising up to the cooler atmosphere. While heat cramps and exhaustion are a common symptom of extended heat exposure, it can lead to nausea, dizziness and vomiting. The heart rate increases and skin shows signs of rashes. In severe cases, which are known as heat strokes, the body temperature rises to more than 104 degrees Fahrenheit. This is accompanied by delirium, seizures and in some cases, coma. And death too can follow if the person doesn't get emergency care. If you think someone has suffered heat stroke, then move the person to a cooler place under the shade. Give him or her water or a rehydrating drink if the person is still conscious. The affected person should not be given caffeine, aerated drinks or alcohol and he or she should be taken to a doctor. Until 2015, the heat wave crisis was not classified as a natural disaster at a national level. Since then, the heat wave crisis has led to development of standard operating procedures and guidelines by the National Disaster Management Authority. These measures have led to significant decrease in loss of life from 2015 when it was 2040 to 24 in 2020. trusted bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian. Even though India has developed SOPs for tackling heat wave crises, the effects of climate change are becoming increasingly evident. The years 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018 and 2019 were confirmed as the five warmest years on record. That's all for today. Catch the next episode of The Morning Show tomorrow. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.